very curious what he's going to bring to us today in the world of intelligent machines and recruitment. Ladies and gentlemen, Federico Pistono. Ah, you're using your own laptop. Yeah. <laughs> Always. Always his own. I saw his presentation, and, now, and I understand why he's using his own laptop. <laughs> Customization. Ah, I know. Take your time, no problem. Okay. All right. Now you're making us really curious. <laughs> Okay. I'm seeing robots will steal your job, but that's okay. Yeah, so that's so why, my answer why, to your question. Why, why is that okay? <laughs> <laughs> we'll see. <laughs> You'll see, okay. What, what is the main thing you want uh, people to remember from your talk? That. That. Well, that's that, the answer that we're, to your we're question. already done then. But, no. <laughs> yeah. Very curious to your talk. Thank you. Good luck. Bedankt. Okay, how's the energy level here? Uh, okay, uh, stand up, everybody. Stand up. Stand up, move around a little bit. Say something, talk to your neighbor five seconds, say the most interesting thing that happened today as you get your energy level up. Okay, now, say something you, you want to do in the next five years of your life. Just scream it out loud, one word. Three, two, one, scream! Okay, thank you, sit down. Now, how's the energy level? A little better? Okay, so, um, as you can imagine, this is a somewhat controversial topic. So I know that even though I'll try to keep it brief, we won't have time for uh, all the questions. So if you want a question that is not answered today, just tweet at this or the text kernel if there is a hashtag, um, and I'll be happy to take it on, uh, on Twitter. So. My uh, journey begins uh, many years ago, but the pivotal moment happened in 2012 where I was at NASA, at Singularity University. Uh, the NASA Ames Research Park in Silicon Valley has an institution called Singularity University that looks at how to solve the greatest challenges for humanity for the next uh, 10 or 20 years by leveraging exponentially growing technologies. Okay, those were a lot of buzzwords. What do they actually mean? It means that if you're trying to help a billion people and you utilize conventional technologies that don't scale quickly and they cost a lot of money, it will take you dozens of years and sometimes maybe even a, a century and it will cost you hundreds of billions of dollars. But if you use an exponentially growing technology, you can do it in five years or in three years. That's how you can get to positively impact more than a billion people. So I was thinking about these issues and um, Singularity is started by uh, Ray Kurzweil, who's a famous uh, inventor of OCR, optical character recognition, uh, technology speech synthesis, the first uh, machine for the blind. Um, he's a multimillionaire who also now is the director of engineering at Google. And Peter Diamandis, who you can see here floating in zero gravity with real life Tony Stark, Elon Musk, and the best selling director of all times, uh, James Cameron but I'm sure he's most proud of that picture over there. <laughs> so this topic is not easy and it's not in any way um, something that you can comprehensively explain in an hour. And in fact, I wrote an entire book which isn't even enough and I'm preparing a second book to dwell into these issues. I wrote this in 2011 and they told me that I was crazy, that I wasn't a professor of economics at Oxford and so I should just shut up. And practically almost all of my predictions came true five to six years later. And now professors of economics at Oxford are saying that they're, they're actually proving the same exact results. So now somehow people are paying attention. Um, let's look at a little bit to the state of the art. So robotics. Okay, so some of you might have seen ASIMO. It's a pretty old project from Honda. It moves around, it has some sort of capabilities, some dexterity. This is painfully slow. <laughs> I mean, open up a cup is something that a six-year-old can do, even a three-year-old. But ASIMO takes a pretty long time to do. It can also move around a little bit, like up, 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 up. 
Okay. So it can jump, it can do some stuff. Um, we have drones that are miniaturized. This is a Firefly drone. Um, and we have robots that are now context aware. So this is a sensitive touch robot arm that actually has a skin-like system around it. So it identifies very soft ob objects and it can operate without crushing or without hitting things. So it can be used in medical settings to help uh, uh, patients who, who have been paralyzed, for example. Um, the same kind of technology has been transformed into a product. Uh, this is 2014 uh, um, uh, by iRobot. This is Baxter. Uh, you, it used to be that you had to program robots to do specific things and they were precision, but they weren't context aware. Context aware. If you moved next to the robot, it would hit you or it would kill you. Uh, and these kinds of new robots, you can literally pick up the arm, show what to do. The robot will perform the action. And if you move close to the robot, it will sense you and it will decelerate or it will even stop to avoid hitting you. So this is an advancement in robotics. Now some more scary stuff. This is Patman from Boston Dynamics, um, developed for the defense, defense uh, uh, military initiative in the DARPA project in uh, the US. Uh, this is Big Dog. It's a big dog. And it moves in various kinds of terrains. Uh, it's pretty tough. I mean, that guy is pretty buffed. So it, you know, it actually can, uh, can bring around more than 200 kilograms of uh, material. Um, it can move around even in rocks. Uh, and uh, streams, uh, so it's pretty flexible. Um, this one, you don't want to be around when, it, when it's operating. Yikes. All right, and you don't want to be followed by this one. It's called Cheetah, uh, bio-inspired. It actually goes faster than Usain Bolt, the fastest human alive, and, or actually ever. I don't think anyone even goes half the speed of Usain Bolt. Um, but you can see that most of them had tethers. Just a couple of months ago, Boston Dynamics released Atlas II, the new hip robot they have. It doesn't have a tether. It can perform actions. So this is about three and a half kilograms. It picks it up. It moves it around. And it can do quite a bit of things, um, including um, responding to disturbances such as this one yeah almost there okay just give me a second All right go. oh son of a y you started to, to feel a bit of empathy for this poor robot so the guy is just like no no you can't have it just ah oh. oh man <laughs> there is a funny video of someone like um, voicing the thoughts of the robot <laughs> on the internet and a lot of swear words that I can't say on stage, but like this one. So not very nice, but this is a huge achievement. Robots have never been able to do this. Not a robot of this size. Anthropomorphic robot that can fall down and pick itself up, no problem. Resembles <laughs> threateningly <laughs> some movie we have seen. Um, but before we get into that, let's see the other side, artificial intelligence. Granted, you need some art, well, narrow AI or some you know, various algorithms for um, vision analysis and movement and kinesthetics to move robots, but artificial intelligence seen as more like software for the sake of software that doesn't have a lot of sensors. So let's go back in time a little bit. 1952, Arthur Samuel on the IBM 701 programs a software that can beat a good player of checkers, even an expert player. A lot of people thought he was just bullshitting. They said that it can't be real. Um, he said, no, no, it can beat the, the world champion. They said, no, 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 that's impossible. It will take 100 years at least to beat the human you know, champion. And uh, they performed some tests, but has to be in a controlled environment with 
judges and so on. So finally, uh, they did it in 1992. The Chinook team beat the world champion in checkers. I said, okay, checkers is easy, uh, but they'll never beat chess. Uh, computers will never beat the chess grandmaster. And of course, we all know how it worked out in 1997. Gary Kasparov versus uh, Deep Blue. It was a sound defeat for the best chess grandmaster of all times, most, uh, you know, most people consider him to be. Now fast forward to 2011. IBM Watson sets up to defeat the best players of Jeopardy, the all-time best players of Jeopardy. Jeopardy, if you... Uh, how many of you are familiar with Jeopardy? Okay, so it's 70%. So Jeopardy is this game where you, you essentially give the answer and you have to understand what the question was. They use puns, uh, trick questions, so you really need to understand language and context. And uh, Watson beat the two best players of all time to a ground. So when this happened, they were like, okay, but you know, it actually was not a real test because it's just that the machine was faster at playing the button, so the human players could couldn't understand what the question was before it was even formed. So if, if you didn't have that restriction, the, the human players would have won. Surely they never beat Go. Because Go has such a level of complexity, they will take machines, you know, decades. They actually did a study in 2014. 250 of the best experts in machine learning from around the world were asked, how long would it take for a computer program to beat the world chess, sorry, the world Go player, best player, the grandmaster. And they said, a minimum of eight years, probably 15. This was 2015. And we all know what happened a few months ago. AlphaGo from Google beat the world champion at Go. Completely unexpected. 14 years before the best predictions from the best experts in the world, not the popular press. So this was developed using DeepMind, a very secretive branch of Google. They acquired, I think, the startup from uh, London, if I'm not mistaken, for $950 million a couple of years ago. They taught it how to play different programs, uh, in particular uh, video games, like the Atari, Pong, and other games. So you would learn the skills. And then they are trying to apply that knowledge to uh, different things. Um, there is also an open source uh, deep learning uh, library called TensorFlow released by Google and a lot of companies are starting to use it. And Watson has also been put to use uh, um, in uh, commercial applications. So the Jeopardy was really a test to show what the technology was capable of doing. Now they're using it for healthcare to aid healthcare workers and physicians in getting the right diagnosis for patients. Customer service, finance, uh, even recruitment, I hear. They call this cognitive computing. I think it's a little bit of a buzzword. Doesn't mean much, but that's what they market it as. But there is more. Um, software is better um, in some cases than lawyers, than some lawyers at least, and some of them are being automated. According to Forbes, uh, if you want to go to law school, they might not be the best decision for your life. Um, a lot of articles uh, you've seen today also uh, are written by computers that you don't know about it. We know that Forbes has its entire um, sections for um, uh, finance and there are a lot of sports uh, uh, and real estate that are using these uh, cognitive science and other, and other companies that are using these machine learning algorithms for generating articles. But a lot of news sites, they use it and we don't know about. So it is estimated that anything between 5 and 30% of all articles out there are written by robots. And you don't know. You might be thinking, oh, this journalist is pretty good, but it's actually a robot. Um, but we have a bias when we know that it's written by a human. So I predicted that within 20 years, there would be a Pulitzer Prize level of piece written by a robot. But Judges would only give the price if they don't know it's a robot. Um, AI has been found better at diagnosing um, uh, patients uh, and treatments for patients than doctors in some cases. And they can detect cancer with more accuracy. 
They can also aid surgeons, like the Da Vinci. It can give micrometer precision to the operations and the surgeries they do. And according to Vinod Kosla and some others, within 20 years, they can replace 80% of what doctors do. Taking it a step further, how many of you remember Star Trek? The tricorder. You see someone who's sick and you're like, Doo -doo 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 -doo. oh, and you get a full diagnosis of what the person has and what it should do. Now, this was a dream and it's now turning into reality. The X Prize put out a $10 million prize for the philanthropic prize for a team that can develop a prototype, working prototype of a tricorder that can diagnose you better than a board of certified physicians. And it works on a smartphone or a attached device to your smartphone, and it can be delivered for free to anyone in the world. And the technology will be open sourced for anyone to use. And it's managed by a nonprofit, so this would help the entire human race. Um, the same goes for uh, education. 850 million people don't have access to the basic knowledge that they need to even start what we call an education. So they can't read, write, or do basic math. So $50 million X prize for a team that can develop a narrow AI that can independently, regardless of the language or the location, teach a kid basic math and English, all in its own. And it can work on a $20 tablet, which is given away by Google and Samsung and others. So you can teach 850 million people in 10 years instead of 60 to 100 years and more than you know, 100 billion required, estimated by the UN. Maybe you can do this with a $15 million X prize. So that's the idea. And even a step further, the gift of knowledge X prize, which is a one that it's currently being developed, and $15 million X prize to help anyone have a, a lifelong learning experience from the moment they are born until their you know, old age by giving them personalized advice on what they should learn using free resources. Uh, so essentially a personal AI mentor or a digital Aristotle. Now this all falls into the big trajectory of the exponential growth of computing. So we can trace it back to the 1900s when it wasn't just computers, but it was essentially anything that can um, grow and improve itself exponentially. Uh, because you are always developing the new technology with the latest technology. And so the speed is actually a double exponential because this is a logarithmic plot. So it goes from, you know, 10 to 10 to the 5, 10 to the 10. So if it were a straight line, it would be an exponential, but it's a curve that's going upwards. So the speed of innovation is actually going faster than an exponential rate. And according to Kurzweil and some others, this would lead to a singularity where we can't even predict what's going on, but that's highly debatable. Now, let me put my skeptic hat. How many buzzwords have you heard up until now? How many of the stuff that you heard, you're like, yeah, sounds great, but whatever. How many of you think that the stuff that I just talked about up until now is a little bit science fiction more than science reality? No one. Wow. Okay. It's a pretty progressive crowd. But I want to do a reality check just in case. So you remember this, right? Yeah, OK. So this is one company, Boston Dynamics. Let me show you what the DARPA challenge for 2015. These are the best teams in the world, except the ones that are so already advanced that they don't need to participate because they don't need a $10 million prize. But this is what the best teams in the world presented at the 2015 DARPA challenge. Right? So that is the most advanced that we know of. There might be something secret that we don't know of. But when you see a video that goes viral, 
know that they maybe took 20 videos or 100 videos, and they're only showing you the one that just happens to work really well. In research, this is what scientists, unfortunately, they have to do to get funding. So the media hype is much greater than the reality. Uh, and in fact, even the best company in the world now is up for sale. Because apparently, according to Google, that wasn't profitable enough or quickly enough. So they're selling Boston Dynamics after buying it just a year and a half ago. So what's going on here? And you remember this amazing defeat of the world champions? Yeah, as I mentioned, the clicker was a determining factor. And this happened in 2011. Now, it's 2016, five years. We should see Watson on every pocket. Like, every app you use should use Watson, or a very large portion of them, according to, you know, this exponential growth of technology. And why don't you have, like, oh, phone, I have a cough. What is this? <coughs> cough on your phone and get a diagnosis. Why is it not happening? Well, that's because things don't happen as quickly as the media portrayed. Remember the Google autonomous cars? I do. I was there in 2012. I was inside the Google car in 2012, two years before it was even, you know, publicly announced that they would actually do it and they were on the streets and so on. And I drove on it. Well, the car was driven, but whatever. Um, that was 2012. Where are the Google cars now? How many have you seen in the, on the streets? So the marketing and the headlines are very different from what basic research means. And in terms of basic research, if you ask the, great, the greatest experts on AI, including, well, now the recently seized Mar Marvin Minsky, who was probably the godfather of modern AI, and many others, they say that we haven't progressed substantially for 25 years on AI. We have a lot more computing power. We have better, more refined searches and, and algorithms that we use. But in terms of fundamental research, there is nothing new in the last 25 years. So this scenario seems more far away than it might have seemed at first. So why do I think that robots are going to steal our jobs? And why do I think that's OK? Like if, if all this stuff is blown out of proportion. And why do so many other people think that, uh, influential people, and including the CEO, well, the now former CEO of, uh, of Google, now the, the CEO of, of Alphabet? Well, it's because technological unemployment is, is the idea that something that's happening now is not part of a cyclical event that happens over and over. It means that jobs are going away, and they're never coming back. But is that true? So it all boils down to this. This time is different, and this is what people who believe technological employment is actually happening um, think. And those who say it's the same old story. Happened before, industrial revolution, blah, blah. Jobs were actually created anew, new industries, new blah. So it's the same old story. So here, how many think it's the same old story? Raise your hand. Raise it nicely so we can see. I would say 20%. How many think this time is different? OK, I'm going to be easy, because I think this time is different, in, fa in fact. And I don't think it because of the headlines that I read, but because I look at the data. So this picture is a picture of the motor vehicle industry. It's in the US, but it represents almost in every industrialized nation about 3% you know, of the population works that works, works in areas of the automotive industry. Those are the people employed, and those are people employed in the Google Autonomous Cars initiative. If you scale it globally, and you put all the people who work in the automotive industry, taxi drivers, uh, cab drivers, uh, truck drivers, uh, delivery, you know, and you put all of the engineers, designers, uh, experts, uh, PR people, anyone who has anything to do with the driverless initiative or research center or application of Google, Tesla, uh, Apple, uh, Uber, Fiat Chrysler, and you put them all combined, the ratios are going to be more or less the same. Even if you increase that by three orders of magnitude, it's still a thousand times smaller. 
or 100 times smaller. So that is the difference. Yes, you're creating some new jobs, but you're taking away so many that that's almost inconsequential. So let's look at the data. This is data for the US. I have data for Europe too. Gray lines are recessions. Now, before 1978, women weren't in the workforce in any substantial manner, so that data is there for historical reasons to give you perspective, but it's not relevant. So every time there is a recession, you have a recovery, right? It goes up. The more the recovery goes up faster, the better the recovery is. And that's um, the corporate profits over time. Now you put them, the two things together, you see the slope of recovery is shallower and shallower and shallower and shallower every single time. Which means it's a jobless recovery, partly due to outsourcing, but partly due to automation. And the outsourcing might stay the same in the future or fluctuate, but one that is sure to improve is automation. So that problem is only going to get worse and worse and worse. You put the things combined, you have corporate profits at an all-time high. Employment to population ratio is at multi-decade low, and you have the shallowest jobless recovery ever. The trend also highlights something else. There is a disconnect between productivity and workers' wages. So wages are stagnant but we have more productivity. So we are making more money, we are producing more things, we are creating more value, but the wages aren't going up proportionally. So what's going on there? There is a distribution problem, it seems. And it's not just the US. This is data from Australia, Canada, France, Germany, Italy, Republic of Korea, United Kingdom. It's the same exact pattern. And if we look at some other data, this is some OECD countries. Italy is way, 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 bad. The Netherlands is doing somewhat better, but still it has not improved in the last 20 years. It has gotten worse. Almost every country in the world has gotten worse among the industrialized nations. I said that in 2011 I wrote and I predicted that within 20 years more or less half of all jobs would be destroyed by automation and just a fraction of them of new jobs would be created, maybe 5%. So in the ballpark of 45% of jobs will be lost irreversibly due to automation. They said I was crazy. And then a year later, a year and a half later, the Oxford Martin School publishes a paper that says 45% of all jobs will be automated within the next 20 years. Holy shit. And 54% of European jobs. And this is the Netherlands. 49.5%. So imagine, all the jobs you know, and all the people you know, within 20 years, their job will have disappeared. The people you know. This is the prediction. It's not, it's a forecast, I should say. Prediction is this is going to happen. A forecast is this is likely to happen given these trends and these conditions. And you can debate the trends and the conditions, but this is what we think is going to happen. So either these people are going to be reskilled quickly or they're going to be out of a job. So is it the same old story or is it this time different? Well, I think this time is different for another piece of data. If it is true that it's a cyclical process, that it happened 200 years ago, it happened 100 years ago, it's, it's going to happen now again, but it doesn't change anything, then we should have plenty of new types of jobs that were invented in the last 50 to 60 years, right? Since the last revolution. Well, just look at the numbers. I did. And... If you list the occupations by number of jobs, you have to go really, really, really down before you find any job that was invented, invented in the last 60 years. Number 33, computer programmers. Which rep so the, all the jobs before that represent 54% of the economy. So essentially 54% of all jobs for sure were not created in the last 60 years. And those are the most populous ones. And among the ones underneath, it could be you know, anything between five, between you know, 5 to 10% to maybe. So it's not true, apparently, that all these new jobs are created. What's true is that you take the same kind of job and you add new things 
you repurpose it, you reskill to be relevant in that job, but it's not a new occupation. So is it the same story or is it different? I think it's different also because of the quantitative reason. And particularly, the variable is time. When something completely new came along, you had a new generation coming in. So you're 50, you do your job, you've been doing it for 30 years. Then these new things come along. Then by the, by the time you're 6, you're 65, you go on a pension, your kids take over, and your kids can do the job that you can't even think of doing. There was a generational gap that allowed for a new kind of economy to enter into place. Now we don't have that gap. Because business is changing and it's changing really fast. 90% of the Fortune 500 companies that were in the 1950s didn't exist in 2014. 90%. So they were out of business. And it's predicted that within the next uh, 10 years, 40% of the Fortune 500 companies of today will not exist. So we went from something that was the consumer economy to a creator economy where you using a product becomes the creator of value when you search on, 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 uh, on Google, when you upload content on YouTube, you are generating actually the value for the company. And now we have the superstar economy where very few companies take all of the money. This has been true for the music industry. It's true for global wealth distribution. And look at the new companies. Airbnb is $25 billion valuation. Uber 50, some say you know, 60 or 65, depending who you ask. Um, the Unicorn Club, startups that in within two, three, five years become a billion dollar company. This is actually an interactive website you can visit and it lists all of the companies that were billion dollar businesses, unicorns, and how long it took for them to, to get there. And here you can see Twitter, you can see um, uh, Netflix uh, and WhatsApp, and the latest, uh, chat.com, within a four month period went from zero to a billion dollar valuation. And what is it? Shopping website with real time pricing algorithm. Holy shit. All the buzzwords that we thought were irrelevant and didn't mean much, well, it's creating a billion dollar company in four months. That's what's going on. So where is all this money going and why isn't it being redistributed? Well, it's because new companies require fewer workers. Look at that. Walmart in the 1960s, it's worth 260 billion, but it has 2.2 million employees. That's only $100,000 per employee. Look at WhatsApp, sold for 16 billion in 2004, had 55 employees. That's almost $300 million per employee. That's insane. Imagine you have a room of 100 people and that's like a trillion dollars <laughs> in the future. What's going on? Is it the same old story or is this time different? I think it's, this time is different also for a qualitative reason. Because we used to outsource or replace things that were essentially irrelevant in terms of why we are different from the animal kingdom. We used to replace manual labor, things that we did with our bodies. We used to extend our abilities. The fact that I couldn't lift a thousand kilograms was a restriction on my mind. I could imagine lifting a thousand kilograms with my hands, I just couldn't do it. But if I build a machine, it just extends my thought. Now machines are replacing our thoughts because they are getting into the cognitive skills that we are using to differentiate ourselves from monkeys and dogs and ants. So this is why this time is different. And every time I hear someone say, oh, it happened before, we have time. No, we don't have time and it didn't happen before because guess what? It took a hundred years to shift and it didn't replace our cognitive skills. So unless you have an example of the past that has these two conditions, your examples don't mean much to me. According to the research that I mentioned before from Oxford, if you are an advertising sales agent, you have a 54% chance of being replaced within the next 20 years. If you are a sales agent for real estate, it's 86%. If you're a telemarketer, um, check your email, probably you're fired. And this picture, I think, 
doesn't represent the US motor vehicle industry. It represents any industry anywhere in the world given enough time. This is a picture of industry X in five years, industry Y in 10, industry Z in 15, but never 100 or 150. So all of this is gonna happen five to 30 years, not 100 or 200 years. So it's gonna happen within the lifetime of most people here, probably all of, all of the people here. The average competency half-life, that is the 50-50 chance that your competency is obsolete. It used to be 30 years in 1984, and now it's only five years. And in five years, it's probably gonna be three years. And then in eight years, it's probably gonna be one. And then, as soon as you learn something, if you don't learn something new, within six months, you're obsolete. This is where the world is headed. So you, you keep, you have to keep constantly improving and learning something new. Unless you, of course, you are a fashion designer, a software developer, who has to learn something new every day, by the way. That's kind of the definition. So if you look at the conditions, these numbers don't come out of a hat. It's an algorithm based on a model. So do you, do you need to come up with clever solutions? If not, probably you're more likely to be automated. Are you required to personally help others? Do you need negotiation skills? Do you need to convince others? These are kinds of things that algorithms aren't really good at right now. They can influence, but they can't really like, convince someone or have the sort of skills of, oh, I need to pick up the phone and meet this person and have a drink with him or her. Those are the kinds of things that algorithms aren't capable of doing yet. And those are the things that we should be focusing on. Interpersonal skills, general knowledge, linking completely separate concepts that computers can't even think of putting together right now. Um, and if you are a physician or a surgeon, you're probably okay. So if you wanna check if your job is gonna be automated, take a picture of this link, which I prepared for you, very handy. I think now it has like more than you know, 100,000 clicks because all my conferences, I use this link. <laughs> Everybody, chick, chick, chick. <laughs> all right? You guys good? Okay. So business is changing and it's changing fast. Skill acquisition is important, but also skill relevancy. How many of you use Duolingo? All right, it's great, you can learn a new language. It's free and it's a game. You start, you have a path, they ask you questions, you type, you speak to it, you listen, you repeat, you, you write down translations. And it's really a game, it's fun and it tells you how fluent you are in the language. And then, guess what? You can add to your LinkedIn profile with one click. But here's the, the catch. If I add this to my LinkedIn profile, it says I'm 36%, I'm you know, intermediate, starter, whatever. I don't use Duolingo for six months. I don't prove that I learned Spanish. It goes down 20%, 18%. It has a concept of starvation. So that certificate from Harvard from six years ago may be relevant now, but in five years, nobody's gonna give it them because in 10 years, skills have completely changed. So what you learned 10 years ago is totally relevant. So also having tools that understand your current level of knowledge are going to be of essence in recruiting. Not just what you wrote on the CV and what you did 20 years ago or five years ago. What did you do in the last six months? So it's gonna impact recruitment. Personally, and I know many, companies like Google and Facebook. I don't use any of the softwares, I'm sorry, but the, <laughs> for recruitment, I manually check GitHub and Stack Overflow for top users, for finding great developers. That's how the big companies that I know look for developers. So forget LinkedIn, companies use GitHub. And for many, at least programmers and developers, GitHub is kind of the new resume. It has its own system also for finding talent because they saw that there was a good opportunity there. All of these things have one in common. Prove your reputation. Prove that you have a reputation and how do you do it? You establish that you are a thought leader. And I think that probably the best way is to share your expertise and to share it for free. For example, this is how I was approached they watched my TED video, or maybe they watched another conference that I had. 
there are 100,000 people on YouTube who are sharing their expertise for free. Most of these people are not making money from the ads on YouTube. They're making money from being exposed, establishing themselves as, as thought leaders, and then being recruited or asked by someone to do a service for them. And of course, this is not the only way. That's just one of the venues. Um, and there is even ways to um, empower these people in a, in, a, in a more meaningful way. So what I care about is learning and, and lifelong learning and education. So I have my company, which is called Konos, where you can actually transform your YouTube videos in courses and give a more rich experience in a learning environment. And so I eat my own dog food. I also created a course called Robots Will Steal Your Job and Basic Income. And I have thousands of people following me there, and we have discussions, and that's how I'm communicating with my audience, and I'm establishing myself as a thought leader, and I'm doing that for free when I do it online because it, it's liable to the process of ephemeralization. It doesn't cost me anything to put up a video. It costs me to you know, travel three days, come speak somewhere. But this stuff is free. Why? It doesn't cost me. And it gives me visibility. And this is what many people are doing. Um, this is my teacher profile. I have 14 courses I'm teaching. Those are the subjects. And this is my learning profile. Those are the things that I'm learning about, time and space, uh, uh, you know, um, cosmology, mathematics, uh, economics, uh, investigative journalism. These are the, the number of hours that I spent, and you can go granular and see for each of the categories the details. So is it the same old story? Or is this time different? I think it's this time is different because business not only is changing fast, but we have to do something about it. And what we can do, I think, is to embrace technology and learn how to use it instead of to be used by it. A lot of times we kind of feel like all these new apps and new developments and Google has done that and Facebook. We kind of feel like we are not in control, that stuff has been thrown at us and we're always catching up to whatever is coming and we're never fully in control. But in a way we can be if we, one, are not scared of new technologies but we understand how they can help us. It is important to know, for example, for privacy concerns, um, what your phone is doing, how you can be protected, what apps help you encrypt messages, if you care about that. Learning about these things is not the realm of tech people anymore. It should be public education. Because it's our own responsibility. Our lives are becoming digital. And learning how to use the tools makes it possible for us to be in control again. And essentially, change is what needs to happen. And everybody always wants change. Who wants change? Somebody also won an election or two, I, I hear, by using this word. So who wants change? Let's see. Come on, who wants change? All right. Now, who wants to change? Yeah, cheesy bastards. <laughs> okay. <laughs> all right. Well, I really hope that you mean it, because I think we all have to change and think about how we are changing, because we actually impact what companies do. We have seen um, the blowbacks that um, uh, companies had and governments had when we took action. And we made a statement, and there are consequences. You can stop using an app, you can stop buying a product, and they will, that has an effect. You can change the way the market behaves and it works if you use essentially your purchasing power and your eyeballs as a currency and as a vote, because you are voting every time you use an app, essentially, or every time you buy a service, you're voting. That's our new voting. It's not, it doesn't happen every five years, it happens every day. And that's a decision you can make for yourself every day. So thank you, this is my um, contact information. Tweet at me for questions that I will not be able to take today, and uh, thank you very much. Any questions for Federico from the audience that I can take? No? Well, you know, I had the, I had the luck that I 
could look at your presentation a little bit earlier. So I, I used the bit.ly and I checked for will the recruiter be obsolete? The problem is the recruiter job wasn't in the database. Yeah, it wasn't, it wasn't there. There were 160, I think, uh -huh. uh, occupation types and so, recruitment so what, wasn't what, there. So what is your guess? I think, um, well, this is, let's say, take it with a grain of salt, because it's outside my specific area of expertise right. predicting one particular type of job. Right. I look more at trends, but I would say, um, for those who don't utilize and learn the new tools that are coming available mm -hmm. uh, and stick to the old way, they are very likely to be automated or phased out of the, the, the workforce the very equation, soon. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So if I adopt, I still have a chance. Yes, I think so. Well, I be, Maybe not in the long term, but that's topic for another discussion. Maybe. Yeah, because the industry, I, I have been headhunted during this conference by email, just like half an hour ago by yeah. a tech company. So I just, I just thought, I asked you the question, do I still have, uh -huh. survive in my current job as a recruiter? So. Yes, <laughs> he, he had a question. Uh, I was wondering, uh, so, oh, wow, this is loud. <laughs> uh, I was wondering what would happen, let's say, if you, okay, let's say everything gets automated, uh, people don't change, uh, get out of a job, etc. At some point, I think these big companies also lose the market they serve because people won't have the purchasing power anymore since they're out of a job. Yeah. How, do you, how do you see that going? Yeah, I mean, that's, that's of course, you know, the... the the, the, the age-old question, what if nothing changes except this? Those are paradoxical situations. So, you know, the market self-adjusts and clearly companies try to squeeze every inch, every, you know, drip of juice that's somewhere until there is nothing left and then they, they try to adjust differently. So to answer that situation would never happen for the way the market is, is, is created. But there would be long periods, maybe even five or six or 10 years, of deep, deep economic instability. Um, people without purchasing power, people who have um, incredible difficulties getting at the end of the month. Um, and you already see that in, uh, in countries like Italy and Portugal and Greece uh, and Spain for a variety of reasons, not just technological employment. Clearly, there are many uh, uh, factors, but it is a structural problem, I think. And I think this outlines the relationship there. There is an underlying problem of distribution, and technological employment doesn't cause it. It makes it worse. So unless we solve that political problem first, social and political problem, the advent of automation is just going to increase the problem so much more and make it so much worse. Yeah. Okay. One more question here. How many years do you think it will take that machines uh, become smarter than us? And if they become smarter, will it become a threat? Yeah, so it's, it always depends on what you mean by smarter. There are already machines that are smarter than us in many things. Um, what I think you are suggesting is a general level of intelligence. So a machine that can independently think of any solution to any problem. It's called AGI, Artificial General Intelligence. I think most experts, and I agree, uh, I'm, I'm inside that uh, realm, uh, think that it's very far away from an AGI level. But in order to automate or render obsolete most jobs, you don't need an AGI. You just need thousands of very narrow artificial intelligences who perform tasks. And if you have thousands and thousands of them, each smarter than humans at that thing, and you have enough of them, you have a big enough problem to um, destroy the, the job market as it is now. For the self-thinking machine, how many years do you think it will take? The self-thinking, so the general, well, <laughs> you know, forecasting these kinds of things has always been the, the Marvin Miski, who's one of the greatest, predicted they would happen within 20 years in the 1950s, and it didn't happen. Because he was basing on, on his own research, he was seeing a you know, speed up of the process. So, I don't know. I think it's more than 20, less than uh, 60. Okay, One question here. So, to your point about the um, number of jobs that are just going to become obsolete, and yeah. the number of people who will be unemployed, and the sort of economic uh, difficulties that countries will go through. What is the end game? Where, I mean, if 
you don't need as many people using your Google example to ultimately do these things. Yeah. How will there be jobs at the end of this cycle? There so won't be as many. So then what will be the economic methods that people will earn money or how will they be able to afford to do that? Right. So that's the discussion that's happening right now. Not as much as I would like, but thanks to some of my colleagues at MIT and Oxford and, and other researchers and the work that I'm doing, it's now a matter of public debate and one of the hottest topics is a basic income, which is you give a floor, essentially, covering the basic needs for everyone and then anyone can earn more by you know, working essentially or doing uh, services or things that, uh, that can help um, uh, the society. So in a way it's just essentially extending the public utilities that we have like roads and, and, and water to food and shelter and energy which is not so far away if you think about how the level of production and uh, the productivity is going. So it's not a stretch of the imagination to think that it's possible. And economists are debating whether that's feasible with the current taxation system, where it has to be completely rethought. Um, there have been about four studies um, with some substantial numbers, you know, a few thousands of people. And it seems to suggest that people actually work more when they have a basic income. They are more productive, they work more, they take more risks, because if I have a basic income, regardless of whether I work or not, I have an incentive to start working, huge incentive, because if I, if I make money, I'm going to make all the money on top of it. But if I am on unemployment benefits, I have zero incentives to start working, because the moment I start, I lose my benefits. So that's the benefit trap, which is where we are now. So this would actually free people to take risks and become entrepreneurs. Uh, where they performed the study in India and in Canada, Granted, it was only 18,000 people each, so not a big number, but still um, three times more likely to be an entrepreneur, 200% increase in entrepreneurship. So more people took risks because they had a safety net. But I think before we can get to decent numbers that we can say we can deploy to an entire nation, we need many, many more studies. And now actually the, the Netherlands is going to test with two cities, I think Kroningen and Utrecht. Uh, in the next couple of years or so, and uh, Finland is going to test uh, uh, nationwide uh, with a control group uh, study with a few thousands of people. And there's also another experiment in uh, Auckland run by Y Combinator. So I'm, I'm really hopeful that these studies will give results and, and uh, produce more studies. Okay, more questions. Bill. Um, it, it's a couple of things. First, um, it's job. I think just different jobs. Um, that would be my observation. Second thing is um, I'm interested in your thought about when social learning will get the same or greater recognition than academic learning as is the current status quo. All right, great question. Uh, the first one, I think I'll take you separately because it will take longer. But the second, um, it's uh, one of the things that closest to my heart, which is how do you actually assess how people, uh, what people are learning and how well they're learning something when they're studying together or where they're teaching each other or where they're working on a project? That, at the moment, is cognitive surplus that isn't captured. So capturing that is going to be huge, probably bigger than academic learning. And what I'm trying to do with my platform and what others are also trying to do um, is exactly that, to match the interactions to see the value to extract the value of these interactions and um, to, to, to give it structure that actually makes sense and not just, oh, uh, you watched X many hours of videos on this topic, you, should, you probably know this topic. It has to come from a much more complex interactions between peers and their level of understanding and reputation. Do you think, uh, how far away do you think that point is when that will be recognized for employability, where, where employers will look for a score of 97 on Minecraft right. rather than a degree in computer Yeah, it depends science. on the employer because today already some employers are looking at the interactions. They see, oh, you worked on this open source project on GitHub and you actually did 12,000 commits on this. Oh, wow. Okay, we hire you. Done. So it depends really on the employer. And like William Gibson said 20 years ago, the future is already here. It's just unevenly distributed. Okay, 
Well, I think that's a very nice quote to close off with. So, ladies and gentlemen, I got a big hand for Federico Pistorno.